Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for organizing this forum and for giving me the opportunity to participate in the panel. Uh, congratulations to the SSM on their fifth birthday. That's almost young adult by now. Uh, I've been asked to put forward, you know, a few ideas uh, that may motivate the discussion for the panel on what the future of regulation is holds for the banking sector. And I'm delighted to do that, and I'm flattered, and I appreciate the opportunity, you know. As you know, the main task of the ABA is to contribute to the creation of the European Single Rulebook in banking, you know. By single rulebook, we mean a single set, as Andrea was just mentioned, of harmonized potential rules for financial institutions throughout the European Union. You know, hopefully that will help create a level playing field, provide adequate protection for, for depositors, investors, and consumers, and foster competition. Now, since 2011, the ABA has actively contributed many areas of this potential regulation, leading to more harmonization rules across the EU, where you know, NPLs have been mentioned, internal models as well in the trim project of the ECB. It's another area of attention, but there are many other areas. You know? So what I would like to quickly discuss is what are the main issues that we see going forward in the regulation, in the regulatory framework over the next year, year and a half, and hopefully that will be uh, a basis for, for our discussion later in the panel. Now, uh, before that, I think that uh, I can make a very quick assessment of what the overall perception of the situation of the banking industry is right now over the last few years. It's been mentioned already by the Vice President of the ECB and, and by Andrea, Chair of the SSM in high degree. You know, banks have managed to significantly enhance their capital position. You know, uh, core equity tier one ratios have gone up from 9% of the crisis to about 14.6% today. Asset quality has improved. There's been tremendous progress on NPLs. You know, uh, the NPL ratio has, is now 3%, you know, compared to about double that, 6.5% in 2014. You know, a significant reduction. There's still work that needs to be done in that area, and both not just on the stock of NPLs, but on making sure that the flow of NPLs, of future NPLs, is adequate. So on that far, we have put forward, for instance, some long origination guidelines, you know, that are under consultation right now, which hopefully will help in making sure that, that the adequate flow of new business comes in so that the adequate flow of new MPLs will also come out at some point in the future, which I'm sure will arise as the cycle moves along. You know, similar to the capital ratios, as was also mentioned before, liquidity has also increased. The LCI ratio is about 150% in the union. That's significantly higher than before. However, you know, and this has also been mentioned, there are challenges in the industry, and the most obvious challenge is profitability. Profitability has been low for a number of years, persistently low below the cost of equity on average for the industry, and that's a significant challenge. You know, furthermore, this challenge on the return on equity seems to be relatively unique for European banks. It's not the same challenge that happens in other parts of the world, particularly in the U.S. or Asia, as we look at the behavior of other banks. So there are specificities in the, UA, in, in the, in the European Union that, that needs to be address. This difference is likely not to be attributed to a single cause. You know, macroeconomic conditions, the impacts of monetary policy, competition for newcomers from technology, the need for technological transformation investment by banks, probably excess capacity, as mentioned, lack of ability of concentration and orderly restructuring in the industry. Those are explanations that have been suggested, but we need to make sure and be honest as well that uncertainty around regulation and, super, and supervisory expectations in the European Union is another one of the reasons that is often mentioned. So in this panel, I hope that we can provide a little bit more clarity, at least so as to reduce the uncertainty. You know, we can, not talk, but we can discuss about the level, but hopefully the panel will help to reduce the uncertainty. So let me talk about a few topics that I think are in the agenda going forward and uh, that we'll probably discuss. Uh, first, finalization of Basel III. You know, the finalization of Basel III, I think the key word here is finalization. You know, finalization of Basel III is clearly in the agenda. You know, we have been discussing this for many years. This has been a major improvement in the regulatory potential supervisory environment of worldwide banks. It has helped the whole Basel III process to rebuild trust and rebuild the economic recovery for the last 10 years. And we need to finish that. You know, the new Basel standards that have been approved, the last part, you know, they managed to maintain risk sensitivity in the new standardized approach. That was an important condition for European banking industry. And that was, I don't need to be honest, that was maintained with a difficult compromise, which was on the, on the, on the status of an output floor, as well on risk base. You know, that was a difficult compromise, but it's important to keep in mind that it's an important part of the whole package for that compromise. Now, 
We issued in July of this year, the ABA, after a request from the European Commission for a call for advice, we issued our policy recommendations and our quantitative impact assessment in many of these areas. You know, I will not go into the detail, but just on the policy recommendations, you know, I would like to make three solid general remarks. The first one is that, you know, it is important to ensure from the perspective of the ABA that EU implementates in full these packets of Basel III, you know, and avoids any material deviations. You know, the reforms have introduced, as I said, more recent sensitivity was an EU important priority, keeps a harmonized set of rules at the global standard which facilitates global financial flows, facilitates global banking, facilitates global trust, coming back to the end of Andreas' speech, I think that's very important. But to facilitate that also, international coordination is necessary to ensure this full implementation. So we also be, you know, aware and, and concerned about possible not full implementations in other parts of the world because, you know, and, and, and unilateral implementation by any jurisdiction will not provide a level playing field, will not provide trust in the global level, and that's an important constraint. So keeping an eye on what's being implemented in other jurisdictions is also important. Finally, the third general point, you know, is that as we assess the impact and finalization of Basel III, and this comes back to the message that was sent by the Vice Chair also in the speech earlier today, we need to have a full assessment of how the implementation of Basel III uh, enters into our current overall capital requirements and functioning of the different capital buffers and capital constraints that we put on banks, you know? And in particular, to the extent that now we do have certain parts of the regulatory framework that are being in place at a certain level to try to counteract with some of the weaknesses that Basel III is supposed to help fix, you know, we should recalibrate those to the extent possible. Now, in terms of the quantitative assessment, you know, we had forward with a number that was 24.4% increase in average capital requirements. You know, two comments on this. You know, this number seems large and it's not small. You know, but first, it's not homogeneous across the union. It's focused on a, it's, it's concentrated in a small set of large banks. It tends to be highly correlated with the use of internal models by banks, which is not surprising given that that was one of the targets of Basel III. Second, more important, this is clearly to be a conservative estimate and upper bound because it's calculated under a number of assumptions, all of them in the direction you know, of likely uh, bias in this number upwards. More important, the assumptions are the remaining of the status quo. The banks' balance sheets remain as they are today, and they made the assessment without thinking about how would they react to the implementation of the rules, also the existing capital requirements across all the other areas of, of regulation also remain the way they are right now, and they will not readjust, as I said before, you know, to, to take into account the introduction of Basel. Now, Basel, the impact assessment is not fully yet finished. We need to provide information on market risk, on the final qualification of market risk and CBA, and also the ECB has been working on the macroeconomic assessment of the, of the measure. As you can expect, the macroeconomic assessment will probably come forward with the idea that there are short-term costs, but those short-term costs are compensated with higher expectation of more stability over the long term and potentially higher output growth, or at least less severe downturns in the economy. Now, in terms of other areas of regulation that we have going forward, you know, uh, we have, from our perspective, the implementation of the risk reduction packets that was approved in the, uh, earlier this summer. That's a very important part, package, but as I say, I think the important part is the implementation. We are at the implementation stage. We have, for the ABA, it applies a huge amount of work. We have uh, over 100 mandates that we need to deliver upon over the next three or four years but they're implemented. I think the basic rules and regulations are in the risk reduction packets and they're already, you know, we hope and we will come forward over the next month with a number of roadmaps trying to explain how we are going to come forward with all these uh, technical standards and other regulatory requirements that, that are put forward in that legislation to so try to provide some clarity to the industry of where this is going, but again, this is the implementation phase. It's not the new design phase. Additional to that, I think that we need to have more information on how <coughs> we are going to continue our recalibration and predictability on the application of the rules. And here I go back to the statement that was made by, by Andrea Henry earlier today. I think that's very important to provide trans transparency and predictability to markets, to investors, to the banks themselves, how that rules are being applied, how the consistency of the different buffers are being applied, and at the same time, how is the robustness on those existing regulations. There, at CBA, we have a, a, a clear mandate, which is the stress test exercises that we perform on the industry every two years. We'll perform a stress test next year, but as we go forward, you know, and I think this will know, we are reassessing how to best redesign the stress test so as to build into better 
providing information and clarity to markets, both on transparency, on robustness, and on supervisory measures and implications for banks. I think that's a, an important idea going forward that I hope will reduce also uncertainty. Then finally, I would like to point to two more areas, and I'll finish my remarks. Technological change. Technological change in the industry is coming, it's happening, and regulation needs to be up to the task of the challenges that that technological change puts forward. We have made a lot of progress on payments, for instance, with the PSD2 directive, you know, but there are other areas of technological innovation, for instance, the application of artificial intelligence technology or the, the transfers of risk across the value added chains to other parts of the industry that may not be banks and adequate management of those risks. It's an important aspect of regulation going forward. We have put forward some guidelines on, on outsourcing that will help provide clarity on that area, but that's, we also point, for instance, to the potential concentration risks that that outsourcing is taking place to a number of very few players in certain parts of the IT industry that may lead to potential additional risks or new risks that we're not aware of. Finally, enhanced consumer protection, data usage, cyber risk, and crime prevention. Those are, I think, four broad areas that I'd like to bring forward to the agenda. I think they're all in our agenda. I would like to highlight those four together because of one major characteristic that I think is different from the previous ones, which is that for the previous ones, we had a long tradition of international collaboration, international coordination, international forum through Basel, the FSB, the G20, to try to get coordination at the global level and at the European level in those aspects. In these areas, we're behind. You know, in the areas of AML, crime prevention, in the areas of data protection, data coverage, you know, we need to build that because the essence of the technological changes and the essence of the programs that will arise here are likely to be cross-border. So let me stop here. Thank you for the opportunity. I look for, I hope this has raised some interesting issues for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Kampa. I was well, there's really plenty to discuss, and every single point would be worthy a discussion. It would take a marathon. But let me start with this. We, we heard this morning Chair Enria saying SSM and implementation regulation is not an island. It's a project. It takes dialogue in also with different level. Olivier Gersen, you're working also on a public consultation on the implementation of Basel III. Where are we, and what's your point of view on the direction we are heading to in terms of the future of regulation and implementation in Europe, especially after the approval of the banking package. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, let's start with the banking package and then let's move to, because mm -hmm. uh, it's an important achievement. I mean, the, the, the banking package that we've just agreed, uh, we no need to uh, roll it over and implement it. There's a number of, uh, of uh, uh, very important points I'd like to underline uh, here. Uh, well, first of all, I repeat it, so I'm sorry I'm boring, but we are in a far better place than we were 10 years ago. And I take all responsibility for having proposed, I think, all banking regulations since 2010. Each time uh, my friends in the banking industry told me that this time you kill us, uh, well, the, the banks will not be able to lend anymore. Well, guess what? They're still there. They still lend. Uh, I, I don't mean to say, I mean, there are a number of challenges, and actually maybe the environment today is more challenging than ever. But when you shout very loud all the time, the risk is that the time you have a real problem, you're not listened to anymore. Uh, okay, I close the bracket. Um, the, so the main positive impact of all this and the last banking package on the finalization of Basel III that is to come uh, is really a huge uh, amount of reduction of the risks in the system. So we have a financial system and a banking system that is far more stable, far better capitalized, far more resilient than it was 10 years ago. And that I think is, is excellent news because the times to come are not necessarily going to be a walk in the park. Um, so that's, that's my main takeaway. Uh, and the measures like the leverage ratio, the NSFR, uh, but also the rolling over of TLAC and the, the building up of MREL, uh, which is still things that are in the making and part of the last package, uh, have, a, have, a, have a big role to, to play in order to, to finish, uh, complement this architecture. At the same time, we are, of course, trying to put forward also measures 
that uh, enhance the ability of banks to finance the economy. And we're not always, uh, well, sometimes criticized for this, mostly by our friends in the supervisory uh, community, uh, because it's not, uh, it's not uh, how to put it, uh, orthodox enough. Mm. Uh, and CR2, for example, uh, uh, has improved or will improve the capacity notably to lend to SMEs and fund high quality infrastructure. Uh, and uh, if you have listened to uh, Valdis Dombrovsky's speech to the parliament uh, for his confirmatory hearing, uh, you'll see that he is not ashamed about this and he intends to continue on that path. Of course, we should be careful. Um, I mean, financial regulation is primarily about uh, giving risks, risk signals and uh, uh, we should not uh, uh, trouble this risk signal too much. But still, uh, and uh, coming forward, going into financing green, which is going to be a huge challenge in the years to come, I think we need to, to have a collective thinking about how to do better. Mm. The second important dimension is proportionality. Rules have been made more proportionate, and that goes both ways. They've been made more difficult for big and complex banks, and I think that's, that's right, in particular those that heavily uh, rely on internal models. And that, uh, that will continue with the, with the next uh, package uh, that is to come. I'll come to this in a moment. But they have also been made uh, uh, less complex for less complex banks, uh, notably in terms of, uh, of uh, reporting. And uh, I think that is, that is welcome. There is, I want to be clear, there is a lot of inbuilt proportionality. Uh, when I uh, see uh, uh, visitors from, uh, that are heading small banks and uh, uh, they uh, uh, complain about uh, the output flaws, my first question is always, mm, why are you concerned? Because if you have an issue with output flaws with your business model, then <laughs> we need to talk because they have a problem. Uh, in principle, with a simple business model, retail bank, most of the additional complexities are not for you. You do not rely on internal models. You're not concerned by output mm -hmm. flaws. There are a number of things. You, so your regulation is simple because your, sim your, your model is simple. So there is a lot that is inbuilt uh, in the uh, package. Uh, third, we've been trying to improve the governance and supervision of banks, amongst others with clarifications of the Pillar 2 framework and the requirement uh, for foreign banks with large activities in the EU to establish what we call in, uh, intermediate uh, parent undertaking uh, in the EU in order to be uh, better supervised uh, and uh, also to enhance their resolvability. Uh, so I think all these are very important uh, uh, achievements. I'd like to mention one other point before coming to the next package, and that is NPLs. I mean, Andrea mentioned it. I mean, a very important feature is uh, the Pillar 1 measures that have been put forward by the Commission, the Pillar 2 measures that have been undertaken uh, by the SSM in this respect. And all these uh, are on the back of a relatively favorable macroeconomic conditions led to a marked diminution of the stock of NPLs in uh, the European Union, but also in the, in the banking union. Yet, and despite the measures we've been taken in order to avoid that the stock rebuilds, we all know that this is very sensitive to uh, uh, prevailing macroeconomic conditions. So if we have a recession, uh, we'll need to be very alert to uh, not let the stock of NPLs rebuild. But I think that is, that is a very good news that uh, we started to tackle uh, very seriously and with success uh, <clears throat> the issue of asset valuation. Um, a word now on the future. We have uh, published, uh, we have started the publication on the, uh, we are I'm inviting all of you to uh, comment mm -hmm. on the finalization of Basel III. I never say Basel 3.5 or Basel IV. It's still Basel III. Um, it will be important. Uh, I mean, Jose Manuel uh, said it, so I will not insist. Uh, we do not believe in the European Commission that the impact on capital requirements for bank will be of the magnitude established by EBA. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, 
I'm very cautious, and that's the reason why I'm a functionnaire. I'm a technocrat, otherwise I would be in the private sector. <laughs> he's even more cautious, and that's the reason why among technocrats he's a supervisor. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, the, the EBA has taken all the most conservative uh, assumption, including coming back on existing deviation of Basel in the existing framework, which I'm not sure uh, the co-legislators intend to do. Uh, so we, we don't expect uh, the impact to be uh, of this magnitude. So you the do not buy the number, like 135 billion of capital shortfall? We shall see. Mm. But first of all, we shall see what the Commission will propose, and that will be informed by the uh, impact assessment. And the impact assessment will be deeply informed by the public consultation that is ongoing. That's why it's important to contribute. Uh, and uh, uh, more importantly, and maybe I think that is worth saying, as José Manuel said it, this agreement is a result of a very difficult negotiation in Basel. Uh, Andrea and I were sitting side by side in, uh, in the GHOS uh, for some of these battles. Uh, and in the end of the day, we settled for something that is not what we wanted. It's not either what others around the table wanted, but it's the compromise we found. And you know, this is a repeated game. So uh, there is, it's pointless to agree on something on Basel and do something completely different when you're back home. Because next time you meet uh, your colleagues in Basel, say, well, I mean, why are we discussing here? Mm -hmm. So as far as the EU is concerned, we will faithfully implement the agreement we struck. Well, let me move to Yves Mersch with this, because Olivier Gersens told us at the very beginning, we are in a very better place off versus 10 years ago. The banks are still there, they survived, but at the same time, you know, we are market guys. We look at banks also from a market perspective and the valuation in Europe of banks are historically very low if for all the parameters. And Andrea Henri has told us this morning, it's not the SSM or uh, regulation to blame, but at the same time, uncertainty about the future of capital requirements and so on is weighing on the banks, and yes, they're alive, but they're not feeling so well, at least in Europe. What do you make of that, and how do you respond also to Oliver Gassand on the future of Basel III and the finalization? Well, first of all, um, if you expect me to have major disagreements uh, with the previous speaker, I think uh, <laughs> I must disappoint you, uh, because uh, we have spent all our energies over the last 10 years from every perspective, the monetary policy perspective, financial stability perspective, perspective of uh, su supervision, perspective of oversight, regulation, uh, and we have been working very closely together, not only at the European level, but at the global level, in order to achieve a common response. Because those who put now into question this effort, I think they put into question their responsibility in stoking the most important crisis for our democracies that existed since 70 years. And uh, let's not forget that uh, we have, at least in the public sector, but I also believe in the private sector, at least those who are good face, that uh, we cannot go back to the voter with such destabilizing behavior as we have seen before the crisis. So I'm all in favor of continued dialogue looking forward in the area of implementation, but I am absolutely opposed to put into question the effort that we have done jointly together with the private sector. There were numerous consultations in order to achieve what is now on the table. So that is my first uh, takeaway. Second... Can I translate that the package has to be approved as it is? Or the package is not negotiable anymore. We have already, we see that the level of commitment at the international level is beginning to get more fragile. And we should resist this. We should stand, at least as Europeans, firmly for a multilateral uh, international environment for international cooperation in activities uh, which are international by definition and where the profitability that you, quest that you mentioned is usually depending on scale and scale cannot be achieved in a closely national environment. 
So that is one point. Where I would nevertheless, since you want me to disagree, uh, <laughs> I would disagree on one point with Olivier, that is when he says the banks are still there. If at the end of the process, we would have the same banks with the same size and the same business models uh, in 27 or 28 as we had in 28, then we would have a market economy that is not functioning. What has not functioned so far is the exit of the market, especially, I would say, in Europe, uh, where we are certainly experienced that some of the exit uh, is not functioning because it was protected at the national level, and it has prevented the rejuvenation with new entrants. And we see now the, uh, the new entrants are coming from outside the banks, maybe because we have given too much protection to the insiders. And um, we need, certainly, a new landscape for banking. And we only hope that this will be achieved through the new package, also through a cautious, prudential, prudent approach over time. And that's why we have such a long transition period. And we ask everyone to take advantage of transition period to adjust. But adjustment is needed and will have to come. And we will not compromise on this need for adjustment. Let me say this, uh, and then the second point. Yes, the main package is behind us. What we are discussing in the future is implementation. Implementation, there is still some scope of uh, small adjustments, um, but then there is a third stage, and that is the evaluation after we have implemented. And I accept that not all what would have been implemented might have uh, the same results that we expected them. And then we have to recalibrate down the road. And I think that is also fair, and it's only normal in a functioning society. So, but let's please uh, make the distinction of what is behind us. This package is non-negotiable. What lies ahead of us, that is implementation. And this is small adjustments that could be done, whether we have, for example, uh, uh, now the uh, output floor being uh, applied at the level uh, of the highest consolidation mm -hmm. or at every level of consolidation, I think uh, we are still ready to, um, to quarrel a little bit among us uh, on this, but this is not putting into question the principle. Then we will have new challenges because society evolves, and uh, Olivier has mentioned some of the new challenges uh, where we also have to adjust, but this is not something that is invented by the regulators or invented by the supervisors in order to torture the poor banks. Uh, this is something where we have to recognize together that society evolves, the requirements of the society also are changing, and we have to adjust to it. So I think um, that is normal as well. I will not maybe uh, at this stage uh, go back on uh, some of the papers uh, that calculate disastrous results, uh, because uh, when it comes to statistics, um, I'm all ready to have a good fight, uh, but uh, this should not distort us from having our common goal and be very clear what we need to do is implementation now. And after implementation, assessment and evaluation. And uh, I would uh, rather at this moment uh, leave it with this high-level statement. All right, I'll get back to you a little bit later, Claire. What do you make of, you know, the playing level field that everyone is asking, especially when it comes to the presence of American and global banks in uh, Europe, uh, having seen that also lately, and especially after the Trump election, the push towards deregulation and an ease in the requirements in the U.S. is apparently growing. And what's your perspective on the discussion today? Well, well, thank you. And wow, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I wanted to say happy birthday to the SSM because I think the progress in five years is considerable. Um, but I thought I also, in light of what we've all been talking about, give a nod to Mary Curie, who uh, I often think, you know, she one of the most famous quotes that she made was, the way of progress is neither swift nor easy. And um, I think that all that we've been highlighting in the discussion so far, and it's not quite, well, just mm -hmm. 12 o'clock, 
um, it just shows just how much progress has been made. Um, and I think about our own sort of capital and liquidity journey and the progress that we have made around um, capital um, requirements, liquidity requirements, um, really understanding all of the risks in our portfolios. Considerable progress has been made. Um, we can talk about finalisation of Basel III. Um, sorry, the industry likes to refer to it as Basel IV because there's a, there's a lot of new stuff in there. There's there's new things around the capital buffers that were uh, were put in have been put in place, and um, there've been updates, obviously, to definitions around capital, etc., which all of the banks who are operating in global markets have to absorb and incorporate. And, um, and I think it's fair to say, and we've all acknowledged, that the status of implementation has been varied across jurisdictions. And when you get a varied timetable, there's bound to be <coughs> some slight differences in, in the rules. And of course, that means that you know, if you're operating a bank in global markets, these, there's very big sensitivities to these small def def definitional differences for example, even around, um, and even I have spoken about this in the past, you know, pillar two, if you, you think about how the capital stack for a UK regulated bank versus an EU regulated bank, there are, you know, nuances and differences around that capital stack and pillar two that um, do, do create some differences. So, you know, there will, there will be slight nuance and variations and differences. And uh, yes, the industry is, is concerned about the cumulative impact of you know, the ongoing changes, for sure. And, but I think what's reassuring is to hear that policymakers and regulators are focused on that. And, um, and you know, in the words of um, Vice Chairman Crawls of, of the Federal Reserve, in his capacity of the FSB, the, uh, the priority to focus and take stock and look at you know, what's been the impact of um, all of this regulatory reform, I think, is very encouraging for the banking industry. Well, Jose Maria, all done. Would you two compare SSM with Marie Curie and the breakthrough that she made in science in terms of, you know, the benefit that for all the humanity it had? Because we were together in the same panel two years ago, and the title of the panel was Sustainable Business Model. died in the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And after two years... <laughs> well, she left behind a great legacy. But absolutely, absolutely. Uh, let me start a little bit with a, an upbeat note, okay? Uh, we talk about 10 years. Well, I mean, banks are basically deposit-taking institutions that embark in maturity transformation. And now, this is not a good business to be at for structural reasons. Demand is not strong, and we have a, a negative yields, flat yield curve. Still, the banks are standing up. Huh? We are standing up. We are alive. And we continue to be uh, the main financer of the European economy and the European SME. So uh, we have managed, OK? Uh, profitability, it's true that it's not yet there, but it's improving and it's positive. And, and guys, come on. I mean, return on equity is return divided by equity. You multiply equity by three, return on equity is going to go to one third what it was. So it's natural that with this regulatory push for higher capital and higher quality capital, return on equity is suffering. It's just uh, normal, but it's improving. It's not yet there, but it's improving. And that's very important. On, on regulation, we have survived a regulatory tsunami. I think that expression was mine when I was <laughs> at the other side. Huh? <laughs> we have survived a regulatory tsunami. So we have been able to adapt to a totally different landscape, much more complex, much more stringent. And, and uh, we are doing it. Uh, still, we have left leftovers like uh, Basel IV. By the way, if you don't like the term Basel IV, stop being irritated by the term, and we will stop <laughs> using it. Uh, that's the purpose of the. I'm of, never irritated. Uh, uh, that's the purpose <laughs> of the term. Uh, so we still have Basel IV, but but most of it, it's it's done. And, and banks are embracing transformation in which areas, in terms of culture, is challenging. Uh, Recovering trust is challenging, but we are embracing transformation in banking culture. We're embracing transformation in the digital sphere, where we are being able to be up to the challenge that is being posed by, by the fintech world. Uh, and we are embracing the ESG uh, revolution. Uh. So, well, I think that uh, the environment for banks have changed a lot. And uh, we are being able to survive to this, to this situation. On the not so positives, eh? 
Well, I mean, the first one is that uh, return on equity is below the cost of capital. And here we concentrate on ROE, but I think that really the question is why uh, cost of capital is uh, fixed at that 10% uh, since, you know, mm -hmm. it lo looks like a cosmological constant. You know, <laughs> everything has changed, but cost of capital is still the same. Markets is still perceive the banking sector as risky. And we have to wonder why, if obviously we have made the banking sector safer. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, it has to do with, yes, profitability not yet being there, but also uncertainty on capital requirements. And by uncertainty on capital requirements, I'm not talking about regulation. Uh, what I'm talking about is about de facto capital requirements. Um, regulation, minimum common equity tier one is 7%. The reality is that the banks are operating with uh, close to 12% common equity tier one. This is what the market is looking at. They are not looking at the minimum Basel, Basel III uh, ratio. They are looking at what on practice is being required uh, by regulators. And here it's important to dispel uncertainty. I think it's extremely important through transparency. We still have some way to go because it, we still have, I mean, uh, Basel III finalization, I will concede the terminology. Uh, mm. uh, but, uh, but I think that that's the problem. Market is still perceived the banking sector as not safe because of the fear of, of dilution, because of the fear of higher capital requirements mm -hmm. down the road. And, and, and we need to tackle that. Mm. Huh? Yeah, Jose Manuel Campa, let's get back to this crucial point, which is uncertainty about the future of capital requirement on one hand. It's not just regulatory based, uh, as Jose Mose Roldan was saying, but then the regulators are pushing for more consolidation in the system. And we heard today the structural adjustment is not going as far and as fast as the ECB is expecting. But one of the reasons, speaking with bankers, to be living in the market, is that any time a merge and operation is just projected, then there's a lot of uncertainty about what capital requirements will be attached to that. And yes, Andrea Ria today told us, we've been misunderstood. We'll be more transparent. We'll evaluate every business plan in the medium term and give an individual response. But at the same time, you know, the living proof of what happened in the past are still there. And so shareholders are concerned and managers are concerned. What's your response on this? Well, I think that we have all agreed that implementation is key and implementation has two components. Implementation of the rules and then the actual application of the rules by supervisors and by markets and a good understanding of how those rules are being implemented by banks and supervised by authorities. So that's, that's right. I mean, now you point to one particular rule, which is how do we implement the rules in the process of m and I mean, I think Andrea made some remarks earlier in that process. And I think that that's, uh, for me, a little bit of a puzzle, to be honest, mm -hmm. because I don't think that for many cases, the situation has been that we don't have, uh, that the banks put forward what looks like a good business model and a potential integrating transaction and then they are not sure about what the rules will be implemented on that business model. It seems to me that more likely than not is that the business model may not be there, and we hear a lot of complaints about the business model may not be there. And I also want to bring into this debate that it's not all about M&As, and, and I think East was clear here as well, there's also a lot about orderly exit. What we need is creative destruction. We need the good banks to grow, to do, perform better services in the European Banking Union, to take on the bad banks, and the, but take them on either by merging, acquiring, or exiting them out of the market. That's, that's a healthy market. And I think that's the process of creating destruction that needs to be facilitated. It's not just about you know, whether mergers. Merger is one way of that creating destruction, but orderly exit, you know, being able to facilitate entry into new markets by good banks or gaining market share by existing banks in existing markets, those are processes that need to be more dynamic, I think. And clarity on how those processes are operating within the union, I think it's much more important that the potential regulatory uncertainty that's underpinning some, what could be like large symbolic cross-border or supranational mergers in the banking union in the EU. Mm -hmm. If Merch, would you make of that? Is there any way SSM or ECB in general can create a more attractive environment for banks to merge and to accelerate in the structural adjustment that was asked again today? I think we should clearly not mix up the difficult environment, uh, the origins of the difficult environment uh, for banking today. And it's not coming only from monetary policy, uh, low interest rate for longer time. It is not only coming from the implementation of the Basel framework. 
Uh, it is also coming from competitive pressures uh, that are stemming from, regular, from uh, technological developments. And uh, I can only tell you if regulation is only good for protecting incumbents, we will not serve our market economy. I think uh, the banks have also a role to play to live up to these competitive challenges. But what is a real problem is I still believe that consolidation, to some extent, is being prevented by an excessive reliance on national legislation which provide protection. And as long as uh, some banks which want to consolidate cross-border will have to face different tax regimes or double counting uh, cross-border when they uh, want to move together, when you have uh, insolvency procedures which are also still largely mutually excluding cross-border and where you have clawbacks, uh, for example, which can annul uh, decisions that are being taken. If you have uh, maybe a higher capital requirements in some cases, uh, I think we should discuss it uh, because we should not, and I asked yesterday in an internal discussion inside the ECB, that uh, we have so many new areas, green finance, uh, proportionality, everyone should not be running behind the football altogether. It's better that you have a strategic approach and that each is bringing in to the team what he can do best. And I think uh, what is needed that we also establish all the barriers that are now being preventing a European integration because of the present national legislation. And we still have in many areas excessive national legislation which are mutually excluding European integration. And I want to have a list of all of these uh, areas and then I think together with the Commission and EBA and other regulators we can see what could be done in order to diminish uh, this excessive. Uh, we have, that was the price to pay to move forward, in many cases uh, a directive. Would it not in some cases be better to move to the regulation? Would it not be better in some cases to review also the enormous numbers of still uh, existing national options and discretion? If I see, for example, uh, I take the, the concentration, uh, which where you can have uh, an option uh, to exempt certain uh, areas uh, from this uh, uh, excessive concentration rule. And, um, 11 member states have made uh, use of this national option and discretion. Of course, this is an unlevel playing field. And everything which is unlevel is also preventing <coughs> consolidation cross-border. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, rather than uh, running behind the big themes where the leaders, of course, they have to do that. They have to adjust our societies to new requirements. But in the meantime, we are also I think having a duty to look at the nitty-gritty detail that prevents uh, the real thing to happen. Yeah, we know devil is in the detail and from right. that point of view. But just a quick one on this, because you said before there's an evolution, a revolution in society. There's also an evolution in the economy. We know that the economy is slowing down. Some are concerns about a downturn. Now, you probably on the stage are one the one that knows better the two sides of the story. Monetary policy, you're in the government council on one hand, pushing with every tool possible to sustain the economy in Europe. On the other hand, regulation. Some sees that, you know, tight regulation with loose money do not accord. There's a transmission problem in terms of the effect of the monetary policy in the real economy because regulation and all the what we are talking about is preventing the ability of banks to give oxygen to land to the real economy. What do you make of that? Well, this is, of course, a question I hope that would avoid. <laughs> and, but uh, it is true that uh, there can be inherent tension. But what is important is as in each function you pursue the objectives that is assigned to you and that is very clearly assigned. And if even the Court of Justice has said, Inside the Commission, there have been court cases where there are also conflicts of interest inside the Commission. The court says, no, uh, that's not important. If each pursues the objective of the regulation for which the regulation has been made, 
then the, you internalize to some extent also those tensions. And the same goes for monetary policy. Monetary policy has one objective, price stability. We will pursue it. When we then have issues of financial stability, we should attack it from the financial stability point of view with the instruments that exist. Of course, here we have then again a tension between what has been brought up at the so-called federal level and what is still at the national level. Macroprudential still being uh, primarily a national tool. Mm -hmm. um, but that brings about the question, do we want to equalize the cycle throughout all the currency area? Uh, I think uh, that is not possible because the structures of our economies are not the same, so it's inevitable that we react differently to different shocks. You see now uh, the shock that we experience right now is affecting one country uh, a little bit more than other countries because of its different uh, economic structures. Mm. That's why Germany is feeling the maturing cycle more on the maturing side, while the others feel it more on the cycle side. <laughs> Olivier Gassin, would you make of that? What's your sense? Uh, mm. well, the, <clears throat> I have, uh, in my introductory remark, I got you the, the bright side of the uh, 2019 package. The not so bright side is that uh, the Commission had initially proposed to get rid of a number of uh, uh, options and discretions for member states to segregate liquidity and capital. And the sad uh, truth is that the result uh, after the Council has uh, uh, taken care of it is that it's worse than before. Uh, because we have a problem, in, a very big problem in the EU at the moment, in the banking union, and that is lack of trust. So uh, people that used to be host still believe they're host. And there is no, no such thing as home and host in the, in the banking union, at least. We are all home and host of our banking sector. But the, uh, the member states are, are not yet there. And uh, uh, the, the result is that the ability for uh, uh, individual member states to uh, uh, force subsidiaries of banks to segregate capital and liquidity in that member states has increased and not decreased. And that's the negation of uh, the banking union. That's, that's preventing banks from benefiting from one of the major uh, benefits of having a single market. Uh, and to give you just an example where it's even worse, in the area of MREL, we uh, have a legislation now that foresees a prepositioning ratio of 100, where the international standard for TILAC is 70. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, to tell you a small anecdote, some, some months ago I had a phone conversation with Randy Qualls, and they told me, well, look, I mean, it's ridiculous. And I, why don't we all lower down our uh, prepositioning to 70 mm -hmm. to give a bit of oxygen to the system? I said, well, Randy, I agree with you, but you will be surprised to know that we don't put 100 just to upset the Americans. We have put 100 because this was an issue among our own member mm -hmm. states. And that's why my ability to decrease it vis-a-vis -vis the US is zero. Um, so it, it's completely ridiculous, uh, frankly, and that, of course, prevents con cross-border consolidation. Because I don't think uh, Jose Manuel cross-border consolidation is, is trivial. I think we need both. We need, I mean, and in this country, for example, there is clear that there is to be a national consolidation as well. But we need cross-border consolidations because we need our banks to be able, like any other company, to take advantage of the single market. For the time being, for a number of reasons, they, are, they, they cannot take full advantage, or not at all sometimes, of, of having a single market. Uh, and um, and uh, for me, that is, that is a clear uh, goal. But at the same time, uh, the, the, pre the, the, the prevailing political conditions are, are clearly not met for this. And the second thing is indeed exit. Uh, because not everything will be, will be solved through consolidation. I mean, the, restructure, the restructuring of the banking sector in, uh, in uh, Europe, it is clear that with the current uh, conditions, I mean, you mentioned digitization, low rate doesn't help. I cannot see how you can uh, be profitable or actually not be loss-making if you're a small traditional business model bank. You need to, be, to, to become a bigger traditional mm -hmm. uh, uh, business model bank. Uh, because maybe the low rates will stop at some point, 
but the impact of digitization will not uh, in any case. So, and part of the issue will be exit. Some of these banks will need to exit the market. And this is something the Americans are quite good at uh, doing. And we are very, very bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, having, having even a super small bank exiting the market, it's a big drama in any member state. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, the member states that are usually teaching lessons to all the others about how rigorous you should be, once it's a problem at home, they're just like everybody else. Usually. Do you have an idea how to fix it? Well, that's, that's a very big political problem. So I think that uh, as any cultural problem, it takes more time. And, uh, you know, in this case, before the culture has changed in member states, we'll not be able to pass a law. And even when we will have passed a law, it will be still some time before it is actually uh, implemented. I mean, if you look how uh, BRD has been implemented, for example, so far, uh, it is clear that, I mean, we needed to have uh, uh, culture to mature before we could have something like BRD. And I think we will need a bit more maturation because before we can have an, actually, uh, an actual implementation that is faithful to the original intent. Uh, Claire, given the combi combination of regulation and the economic cycle, do you think that in the future the only business model working and sustainable for a bank will be yours in terms of the global bank, huge banks uh, with uh, this kind of scale, and all the rest will have to struggle, you know, with negative interest rates and digital competition and the weakening of the economy? I mean, certainly the impacts of technology and digitization and different players coming into the, um, you know, banking market and financial services. Uh, you know, as I look at, you know, our forward calendar of, you know, investments, etc., you absolutely have to have a business model that produces scale in order to be able to, to fund all of these infrastructure projects and ongoing implementation and evolution of the business. So it does seem that, but there's got to be some sort of balance. You can't just have, you know, oligopolies in markets of, you know, concentration of, you know, large institutions. There's got to be a place for, you know, a mix of players to um, ensure that you've got really good competition. Yeah, Jose Maria Rodan. In the end, be frank, what do you expect from regulators and uh, SSM looking ahead? First of all, the, the first message I would like to, to, to convey is that we are not all the same. In Spain, we went from 45 savings banks and banks to 13. Right. You know, the consolidation has been so brutal. I have a board uh, 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 table in the Spanish Banking Association, 30 years old. We had to cut it in pieces because it would not fit anymore. And when we meet, it feels very lonely. So, uh, <laughs> of course, there are countries that have made progress in terms of consolidation. Uh, that's the first message. Second message. Uh, we are in an increasing returns to scale industry, uh, and we cannot deny that. The environment, the interest rate environment, the business environment, the digital revolution, mm -hmm. the environmental revolution, uh, let's not uh, forget that, is going to increase that tendency towards increasing returns to scale. So uh, consolida consolidation, if Euro wants to play a role uh, you know, in the future, is going to be of the essence. Big Spanish banks, big European banks, IT expenses, 5 billion euros per year. That's a lot. That's a lot. JP Morgan, 17 million, 18 billion do US dollars per year. Do we want to compete in the new world? We better, you know, uh, start uh, thinking about the future. Otherwise, we will be irrelevant, as in many other areas. Yeah? Euro will become irrelevant if we, we do not realize the challenges that we face. Not to mention how much Amazon, Google, and Facebook are yes, investing absolutely. there. And I, I don't who knows when today. sooner yes. or later they're going to step in more seriously into. And there's some, some approach on the, on, on the way. Jose Manuel Campo, let me get back to you with a couple of very practical points. For example, you talked about reducing uncertainty, looking at the future, and one of the major appointments next year is the next stress test in Europe. What can banks expect from the next stress test? How will they work? Are you planning to change the mechanism that has been questioned in the past? Yep. Uh, I'm glad that you consider the stress test an important exercise in providing clarity and reducing uncertainty. That's <laughs> the way that's the way we should perceive it should be perceived and that's the way we like it to be perceived. So I'm happy with that introduction. You know, in terms of the stress test, we, we are planning already a cycle for next year for 2020. You know, it's we already had a consultation on the methodology with the industry and with the several stakeholders. We'll probably publish the final methodology in the coming weeks. 
you know, the expectation for next year is that it's going to be fundamentally uh, of the same type of structure that has been in the last two or three years. You know, it's a constrained bottom-up approach with a macro scenario that's currently being worked through uh, in the context of the ESRB. That will be an, a published by the end of January. I don't really have still insights on what that macro scenario will be, but it's based on a macro scenario that supposedly will challenge, you know, all, all the markets mm -hmm. in the European Union in a homogeneous way and provide sufficient stress for the banks in the sample. Uh, it's a, it's an, a scenario that has, in some ways, adapted a little bit to the comments that we have received on the previous exercises, but has not fundamentally changed. You know, it will increase a little bit the transparency. We will ask banks to provide uh, information on their Pillar 2 requirement as a result of the exercise. But again, it's not a fundamentally change. So as I mentioned before, you know, we are happy to engage in a further conversation. We're starting this process to make sure that as we go forward, we continue to enhance these stress tests. And we continue to provide them, you know, in a way that is helpful to markets and providing transparency that is helpful in this conversation with the supervisors and banks mm -hmm. and it's upon the predictability from the point of view of investors of what will be going forward. And as the rules are being implemented and as we assess how they're being implemented, we need to assess also this. Will, will banks have a different say in the process and especially when, the, when it comes to SREP, for example? Well, will banks have a different say? Right now, the banks are providing information, it's a bottom-up approach, they have a lot in determining exactly how that, that methodology is applied internally in their models, and we need to be sure that that implementation is proper, you know, but they're very, constra they're very constrained by the methodology, that's precisely why the methodology is constrained to make sure that the implementation by banks on these stress tests is adequate and the information that we have is comparable. As we go forward, I think one of the possibilities is to allow the banks mm -hmm. to relax on that methodology so they can express better what they think fits more their business model and their ability to react to that. That's what possibly going forward. I think the important thing is that this trust has helped on that dialogue between the supervisor and the banks on what the adequate situation of the bank is and what are the perspectives of how the bank should go uh, Another very critical point is about NPL. We heard again this morning the achievement in terms of reducing the amount of NPL in the balance sheet, but there's a lot of interest and concerns uh, through banking management on what your request will be in terms of uh, treating unlikely to pay and uh, NPL in the future. Do you feel this is the right moment to push further and faster in the process of deconsolidation and uh, de-risking? Well, I think, as I mentioned before, we made huge amounts of the NPL uh, arena. You know, we have doubled, I mean, we have decreased by half the NPL ratio over the last three years. So that's really good. That's an average of the industry. That doesn't mean that there are no pockets still within certain countries or with certain banks that need to continue in that process. But overall, as an assessment of the European Union industry, we said the progress has been huge. I think we have also put in place many regulation and SSM directives on how to manage the NPL flow going forward. We have put forward, as I said before, long origination guidelines that also will help, hopefully, making sure that the new loans that are coming into the banks will not end up being NPLs later on in the process in a percentage that is less than uh, adequate. Mm -hmm. you know? So I think that's all progress. I think that we need to continue on the risk reduction on those pockets, but now they're really talking about pockets where the ratio of NPL remains high, be by banks or some particular countries, you know, but the overall focus should be shifting and making sure that as the new cycle matures, as I was saying before, you know, the flow that we're getting of NPLs is of an adequate size and manageable and respectable, and that we don't end up in mm -hmm. five, ten years on the road after the cycle has gone through the down part of the cycle with a ratio of NPL that hopefully will be higher because that's what the NPLs do through the cycle, but not too high as not mm -hmm. to be manageable. If Mersh, this is interesting because some market analysts and participants are expecting the regulatory pendulum to swing back. And today we heard in the speech of Andrea Enria the word ease. And you know that for central banker words counts more than for Newman like us. But ease it was related just to the reporting sides and to alleviate the burden of regulation on this. But you know, when the word ease comes out of a central banker, it's always interesting, at least for us. Do you expect this regulatory pendulum to swing back? Because listening to your tone today, you're not on this position. I would not say it's a question of uh, tightening or ease. For us, it's a question of increasing efficiency. How get we more value out of the buck? And that is not something that applies in the private sector. We want to apply it also in the public sector. Let me just go back one moment to the stress test issue. 
Uh, we have three principles. First, uh, we do not want to rock the boat. That means uh, for the next stress test, there will be uh, some adjustments, but it will more likely be more of the same as in the past. But we are not autistic. We are all the time in contact uh, with the industry and we try to uh, take in, on board uh, some uh, suggestions that will be made. But uh, there is also already the way forward for uh, the stress test afterwards. After next year, we will have the uh, targeted uh, stress test of the ECB, and we are already discussing uh, what could it be after the liquidity stress test that we did uh, last time around, and we were getting feedback also. We do not stress test in order to occupy our uh, staff. We do stress test in order to get value out of it. And uh, we test this value with the industry, and uh, we were told that this has been extremely helpful. But then there is two uh, dimensions to it. One is the social value that you get out of it for the collectivity, but there is also the individual value that each bank should get out of it. So we are already in the midst of a thorough uh, structural reflection on how we could improve the value of the stress test uh, with uh, less resource intensive uh, measures, both on the side uh, of the supervisors but also on the side of the banks. How can we uh, um, increase uh, what we extract from the same data collection? How can we maximize uh, the value that we get out from the same amount of data collection? Mm -hmm. So I think in this respect, we are already reflecting how can we also not overload the boat? And maybe we should in the future make uh, not a confusion between what is the macro prudential uh, interest in stress test, which is more a top-down exercise, and uh, distinguish it to some extent from the micro approach, which is more a bottom-up exercise. And then maybe we should also uh, not try to come to one single view by all means in a very granular line by line approach, uh, but maybe it would be worse uh, to say here you have the parameters, you calculate what you mm -hmm. want uh, inside each individual bank, you have a bank view, you, you publish it, and we on our side, we could then uh, have a pre-established public methodology and we would do the supervisory side and the market could then reconcile the two. And that would take account both of the specificities of each bank and its capacity to react. Though you see, these are not finished reflections, but we are not static and we want to remain dynamic also in connection with the industry. Jose Maria Roldan, do you feel uh, more relaxed or more nervous after that? Never, never relaxed. <laughs> never relaxed. Uh, I just, I just, did you yeah. hear a, 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 an approach to trying to simplify? Yes, and that's the point. To yeah. Make yeah. the results of stress tests yes. more comparable and consistent. <laughs> Correct. So I mm -hmm. think that's got to be a positive. Yeah, and the U.S. is moving in that direction. That's also very relevant. The U.S. is the U.S. is moving in the direction of easing the burden of uh, stress tests. All Two things but there. But still, I, I think we yes. should also add, but whilst maintaining an extremely high level of loss-absorbing capacity in the system too. Mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That. Yeah, but it's about the process, and I think that we have to look at the US, and that's my message. Uh, on stress tests, first, it has to be credible. If it is not credible, if you are testing the end of the world, nobody will care. So you, the stress tests, they have to be tough, but they have to be credible. Second, for me, the value is more in the transparency in the, in the information it gives to the market rather than the, in the end result. We tend to focus on the end result. For me, the important value is the information you give to the market so that they can, they can make their own judgment. And I think these two parts are very, very important. But it's, it's better for the banks to try to relieve the burden. And it's also better for supervisors. Guys, come on. I mean, it's, it's a major exercise that is taking out a lot of your resources. So let's try to find a way to, to make it lighter. On, on reporting requirements, uh, I'm a little bit skeptical. I was at the other side. I know how tough it is. So we need to do it. Good luck, Andrea, with the effort. <laughs> Claire Woodman. 
Yeah, yeah. Did, did um, you want to add something or not? No, I, 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 I just ag I agree with that. And I think, um, you know, as a management tool, stress testing to make sure that you really understand the risks in your portfolios is absolutely critical. So how, you know, as you talked about, Eve, you, you meld that with a, you know, regulatory framework around stress testing. This can only be, you know, better for the system. Well, now prepare for your questions because there will be time for a few minutes for questions from the audience. But right before that, Olivia Garcin, you reminded us that you're a technocrat, so I'm not asking you Very political so. comments. But oh. to make more interesting our forum today, on the front page of the EFT today, the German finance ministers in a piece says that it's time to end the banking deadlock. It's time to go towards the common deposit scheme and even though he attached some condition, but it's, he says itself, it's kind of a big step for a German finance minister. Do you feel like this is gonna change the agenda or in general the approach and is it a good time? Uh, to be fair, I think ever since uh, Olaf Scholz took over, um, it was perceivable that the uh, the way uh, the Bundesministerium for Finance was engaging in the discussion gradually changed. And uh, so um, the op-ed that he, he signed today in the FT is... Uh, is uh, the end of this process, and if I may say, the beginning of a new one. Um, I think it's a, it's a very good starting basis. It's, of course, uh, uh, under-ambitious vis-à-vis what the Commission think is necessary, notably on the deposit guarantee scheme, because what he proposes is a reinsurance system, and that's it, mm -hmm. with a number of conditionalities and... Uh, Having lived through uh, the painful experience of and an IGA, if I under, uh, sorry, intergovernmental agreement, if I understood correctly, and I can tell you the problem of intergovernmental agreement is precisely that they are intergovernmental. We have this uh, for for the single resolution fund. Um, I'm not sure we're better off that if we were if uh, under the uh, under the the treaty. Uh, and one of the big reasons for this is that. Um, Nobody knows how you police uh, when uh, somebody does not respect an intergovernmental agreement because mm -hmm. precisely you're not under the treaty. So it's not the job of the commission, and it's actually the job of nobody. Um, so it has, a, it has a number of uh, downsides. But certainly it's a, it's a bold move. It's very welcomed. Uh, there are a number of ideas that are worth discussing and exploring. Um, I know it's in particular the... Um, ideas that are sketched in terms of uh, regulatory treatment of sovereign exposures, uh, which is a very, very, very contentious issue. And I, I, I note that uh, Minister Scholz uh, doesn't uh, go on risk weight territory. It goes on uh, territories that are, uh, in my view, areas in, for, with which we can work. Mm -hmm. uh, I note also that he says nothing on safe asset. It's and for a number of uh, for a number of uh, EU countries, the two go hand in hand. Yeah. Uh, you may recall that the Commission put forward a proposal that nobody likes on so-called SBs, uh, um, but has the advantage of providing some form of uh, relatively unambitious and not uh, um, mutualizing self asset which could be uh, make the balance with a relatively unambitious way of dealing with regulated treatment of sovereign exposures. If Mersh, I suspect that you read it. I don't know if you can comment something on that. Well, I, I would certainly uh, say for every stone that is brought to finishing the house, un unfinished house of uh, banking union, I say thank you. Mm. Uh, whatever small the stone is or whatever big the stone is. Of course, uh, we would have our preferences in one side or the other from, uh, I think, as uh, supervisors, uh, we uh, also would normally say that it would be helpful uh, to attack the issue of the regulatory treatment of um, uh, sovereign exposures, uh, but there are different methods to do it, uh, through concentration risk or whatever. Uh, I would say we have 
to recreate the dynamics. And if this is helping to recreate the dynamics uh, to move forward by making, again, uh, suggestions, um, I think this is highly helpful. Yes. Uh, this being said, uh, I also see that this might be one move. Uh, the Commission, uh, new incoming president, has said that she is not shying away from treaty change and she wants to have a conference. Maybe that is a good moment to integrate all the IGAs that we have not been able to capture so far, whether that is uh, ESM or, or whatever. So this is uh, self-reinforcing dynamics that I want to be uh, reinforced and which has been dormant since I would say uh, our late, latest uh, progress uh, two or three years ago. All right, Claire Woodman, just a quick one final for you, and it's about Brexit. How do you see it? You're based in London, oh, and uh, what, was, what your perspective might be also I for the bank? I was trying to panel without <laughs> Brexit. <Stop looking>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for I the bank. I don't have any good jokes, though. <laughs> Please. Okay. No, no, you know, you know, your observation on the impact that this could have on the, you know, single market union, uh, banking union, and the business of you as a global bank. How do you see it? Um, well, well, actually, I, you, I welcome the um, progress on banking union, absolutely. And I, and I hope that this really is a catalyst for, you know, the promotion of capital markets in the EU, because the deepening of liquidity and the development of capital markets is absolutely key. And I think that will help provide alternative solutions for dealing with or NPLs going forward, etc. So I think, you know, in terms of, you know, one of the positives that comes out of this, um, hopefully we see, you know, a much more single capital markets union evolve over time. Chair Kampa, how are you preparing for, for this? For Brexit or for <laughs> Banking Union? <laughs> <laughs> I think the, first of all, the Banking Union, I, think yeah. I take it like a nice birthday present for the SSM. Yes. From the German government, so congratulations on the present, <laughs> which is for all of us. Uh, on Brexit, I think we just came forward with an opinion a couple of weeks ago prior to the, to the removal of the deadline, which we think that, you know, we've been working over the years. We think banks have done a lot of the work, you know, but to make it very quickly, you know, uh, authorization things like that are in place, but I think that the transfer of assets, people, data, it's slow, mm. and it's an opportunity to continue if we think that Brexit mm. goes forward, you know, to the transfer, effective transfer of all those necessary resources across the UK, European Union broader will probably help. Also, some, some concerns are still about on payments, you know, for customers at the individual customer level to make sure that they're being provided those payment services by a UK authority if they're a non-UK EU citizen or the other way around by a non-UK EU business if you're a UK citizen, you need to make sure that that will be smooth. All right, the floor is open for questions from the audience. There are three mics around. Who want to be the icebreaker? Are you still alive? <laughs> please. And please introduce yourself. Thank you, Nicolas Duhamel from BPC Group. Um, benefiting from the presence of Chairman Enoria, I would like to raise a question about Pillar 2. Pillar 2 is depending on uh, mm -hmm. ratings by the BCE. Uh, we have sometimes uh, the impression that Pillar 2 is at least stable while not increasing because of uh, uh, maybe a deeper uh, assessment by BC, dependently of risks and so on. And how do you uh, uh, react to the comment of uh, Jose Manuel Campa about the notion that uh, if we have Basel III, if we have uh, the package with NSFR, LCR, and so on, leverage ratio, uh, do you think really that the assessment of Pillar 2 is going to decrease for banks, uh, having in mind that the legislative packages are weakening the risks in general? Who was the question for, Andrea Ria? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not part of the panel now. He will be here back in the afternoon, I think, for another, for another panel. Any observation on this or if you merge? Well, there, there seems to be a lot of appetite uh, to uh, pluck uh, the pillar two. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there are um, many people who have uh, active thinking about it. Uh, so uh, I ad advise everyone to come forward with its opinion, but uh, I think within the single supervisory mechanism, we have a very firm opinion ourselves, <laughs> which is known. <laughs> Next question. Please. 
Martin Arnold from the Financial Times. Um, I thought the comments about the risk weighting on uh, sovereign debt exposures was very interesting. Um, if the panelists could expand on how they think um, sovereign risk could be dealt with. Um, I think some mm -hmm. of them talked about exposure limits um, as opposed to risk weightings. Um, yeah, yeah I'd like to hear very, more about very that. Very clear. Thanks. Maybe let, let me be, uh, I'm the least compromise of, of all. <laughs> uh, so let me try to answer that. I think that uh, it is easier to go into the avenue or, or diversification limits or diversification rules rather than risk weights by themselves. You know, from a statistical point of view, you know, the evidence on, on, on risk weights are non-existent. I mean, if you look at the experience of Europe in the last 100 years, I mean, or 60 years, 70 years, uh, we have two defaults. German default after the, the Second World War and, and the Greek default that it was not even a default. Eh? So with this statistical basis to construct, you know, risk weights is going to be very difficult. On the other hand, diversification limits may have, I mean, uh, more of a merit. Uh, that's my, my, my purely technical uh, take. My Please. This. Uh, also, I mean, um, risk weights, it's, it's much more heavy in all possible sense of the word issue. Uh, nobody in the world, nobody certainly in the Basel Committee has any intention to touch the, the zero risk weight issue. So the, the real question is why would Europe be the only place in the world in which we think it's useful? Given the number of uh, transition issues it creates. I mean, it's a completely different question whether if you would design an international financial system uh, from scratch, would you design it with a zero risk weight for sovereign? My personal view, probably not. Uh, now, if you have a system that is as complex as the one we have with zero risk weight, uh, would you take the risks of uh, transiting on your own uh, without anybody else on the planet doing it to a non-zero risk weight environment? My personal take again, probably not either. Uh, and that's, um, I, I simply noted that uh, my understanding of a quick first reading of Minister Scholl's op-ed is that he doesn't go in that territory, which I think is is very welcome. And he goes in a territory in which I agree with Jose Maria, is, uh, uh, in which we can work, as I said in my first remark on this subject, which is the area of, uh, of concentration limits, diversification ratio. I mean, you have many ways of approaching uh, these issues, which is at the simplest is it's simply that uh, your, the sovereign you hold is, uh, there's no capital charge up to a certain limit, and if you cross the limit, you start to have certain capital charges. So that you have a disincentive to increase your holding or the concentration of your holding in certain sovereigns slash usually your home uh, sovereign. Uh, it's simpler, but it's not simple. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, if ever we would embark into this, uh, that, that would require very, very uh, deep studies, careful calibration, and probably long transitions. Other views on this? Next question. Can I raise a question to the panelists? Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, shadow, shadow banking. I mean, we talk about the crisis, uh, you know, the role played by the banks. But uh, my impression is that we tend to underestimate the role that shadow banks played in the crisis back in 2007, 2008. Uh, I am worried about shadow banking. And I would include shadow banking, these new big technological players that may come into finance. Uh, we talk about uh, same activity, same risk, same regulation and supervision. Yes, that's ac accepted, but we do not have an activity-based regulation. We have an, a, a regulation that is based on the type of institution that you are. So what is your take on shadow banking? Sure, if Mersh. I can confirm to Jose Maria that we are discussing the same subject. That's enough for me. Yes. <laughs> but I cannot tell you of the outcome. And anyway, uh, we have one objective. Don't forget that. We follow one objective. And to add a word on the previous discussion, we should also not forget that in a single currency area, the sovereign bank nexus 
has proved to be particularly toxic. Absolutely. And that's why one of the reasons why I think uh, we should uh, move forward uh, in this respect. Um, but uh, again, to believe that the central bank activity is a small god for everyone, I don't believe it. Uh, this is an exogenous fact that you have to integrate into your uh, business model, into your risk management, into your strategic steering. And if you try to uh, influence it and to believe that all your future is depending only on central banking, I think I acknowledge uh, your deference uh, to your previous employer, but uh, I think um, that can be dangerous for a bank. Yeah, no, Xiao Banki, I think, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's a well understanding of your concern. Just, I will make two remarks on this. One is, is shadow banking by meaning the things that were being done by banks that are being done by somebody else, and what yeah. the risks are built in there. Mm -hmm. That's one particular concern. There's another conversation when we talk about shadow banking, which is, I think, more relevant for this other, which is activities that are not being done by somebody else, but then when the crisis arise, we do find actually that somehow Thanks, yeah. those liabilities yeah. end yeah. up in the banking sector. Yeah. Yes. And that's a clear area of concern, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, please. But maybe, uh, of course, if I go to an extreme and central banks would open an account for every citizen uh, for different purposes, including payment services, I could understand that you would be worried. Uh, but uh, I hope you believe that we are sufficiently serious. Yes, uh, absolutely. Not to rush to <laughs> such extremes. Absolutely. <laughs> May I add a word on shadow banking? I mean, because based on what um, Jose Manuel just said, I mean, to be fair, um, it was a big subject in international debate, in the, in the FSB in particular. And at some point, some thought we should change the name. Mm. And the shadow banking became non-bank uh, credit intermediation or something like this. Non-bank credit intermediation. And of course, I mean, you know, there's a, there is a very strong relationship between how you name things and how you think things. And I've always thought that, of course, you, I mean, we want to develop a capital market union. Does that mean we favor sh shadow banking? No. I mean, you have a, non -bank, uh, a number of non-bank uh, financial intermediations that are highly desirable. And you have a number that are maybe desirable, provided they are in the light and not in the shade and properly supervised. And you have a number that are not desirable at all. Uh, so I think this is an issue of, uh, of, of uh, being able to distinguish between this. And I would like to say that in the European Union, we made a, a job collectively that were made probably nowhere else in the world. Let me just take one example, and that is the regulation of money market funds. All right. Uh, now, the only thing I can personally regulate is time, and I know that our time is gone, and so I Precisely think now. that the panelists... <laughs> Precise. The panelists offered great food for thought. And my <coughs> last remark is that we heard from Chair Enria today that the SSM promised to be more transparent uh, and a source of stability, not surprise, which improperly I translate in a super boring supervision. But actually, I do not buy this because coming from Italy, I know what we're talking about, a conversation about supervision and implementation is sometimes wild, sometimes dramatic, sometimes chaotic, but always interesting, as I hope the panel has been this morning here in Frankfurt. Thanks for following us and enjoy the rest of the forum. Thank you. Thank you.